All right, everybody, it's another fantastic Thursday for some parts of the country. Uh, <laughs> and this is S.K. Barrett and Real Monsters, and I'm joined by the lovely and talented Russ Hobrick. And the Hello. we are so very happy to have... All right, everybody, it's another fantastic Thursday. Oh, I Thursday. can hear... Somebody's got their speakers on in the background. <laughs> uh, Kelly Evans, one of our favorites, is here once again. It's been too long, Kelly. Hi, how's it going? Good. You need to turn your yep. volume up just a bit, if you could. I'm trying. <laughs> how's my volume? Well, you have played okay. with that, and I am uh, going to. I'm here. Okay. One of my favorites is here once again. It's been too long. Getting Kelly. feedback. Oh, is that me? Am I doing something Good. stupid? You need to turn your yep. volume up just a bit, if you could. I I did it. Oh. It is time for M of the week. How's my volume? Well, you have played okay. with that, and I am uh, going to. Yep. I'm here. Okay. One of my favorites is here once again. It's been too long. Getting okay. feedback. Okay, what's going oh. on? Oh, is that me? Am I doing Good. stupid? Oh, you need to turn your volume. <laughs> uh, time for M of the week. I don't have any Sorry, external Bob. speakers, so I'm pretty sure it's not me. Uh, um. Only thing I can think of is me. What's going on? Oh, is that me? Am I doing good? <laughs> so, while well, you guys are playing with uh, your. Uh... <laughs> I mean, I am on the phone. Can you hear me? I hear. I hear you a little bit, Kelly. I I don't know how I can get. I I. There. <laughs> if I. Okay. That. I think I got it. There. Step closer to the me? microphone. Put down the beer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, this is so embarrassing. Oh, well, well, we'll take it out of your check. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right, so, hey, here's M of the Week, and this was... Obviously, a summertime photograph when she was sunning herself, which she, like every dog, likes to do. But she also likes the snow. She's a dog for all seasons. Aww. And we are going to talk about today something nice little change of pace. Mm-hmm. Art crimes. And since well, not, I don't know anything gonna, about it, we brought in Kelly. We're not going to promise there's not going to be any dead bodies involved, but yeah, it is. It is a little bit different from what we normally you normally do. Yeah, absolutely. We'll try to keep the dead bodies to a minimum, though. Yeah, <laughs> it's you know, <laughs> it's not a prerequisite on this show, yeah. but, but if but, you want to. <laughs> Okay. 
Okay. So, Take it away, Kelly. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. Well, let's jump right in then. We're doing um, art, art theft. And first of all, I think we were talking earlier, and I think what we want to do is dispel some of the myths. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. so, yeah. So basically what a lot of people may think is that art crime is like um, the Thomas Crown Affair, if anybody's seen that movie, all very Hollywood. It's all... It's all very swift. It's all swish. You know, there's billionaires that want art collections for themselves and they break in and they, they decode the, um, you know, the alarm system and they do right. fancy dances right. through all of the laser beams and they manage to get in and get out very smoothly in two seconds and no one gets hurt. And it's all just such a beautiful little wonderful crime and it's like no nah, it's so far from the truth it's not even funny you mean that doesn't happen i always thought they <laughs> shrunk i always thought they shrunk down to the size of sponges and then just slid out under everything until they got to the painting well there's um i don't know there's a show i don't know if anybody's seen it. i'm such a geek there's a show called the librarians and there's one particular episode where someone breaks into a museum uh, like a famous bank and he has to break into... Oh, actually, no, i got a better example. Um, one of the Ocean's movies, I think it might be the second or third one, there's the French guy goes in to, I think, steal either the, the diamonds or a Fabergé egg, and he does this sort of beautifully choreographed dance move through all of the laser beams, and it's like, no, that's just... It's lovely on, it's lovely on TV to watch, but no, that's just not true. Right. Right. So first of all, that idea of spray smoke that will reveal laser beams is a fallacy to begin with. That's just one element. Oh, so when they did it on Big Bang Theory, it doesn't actually work? I'm so disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what I've been told by people who might know. The problem with that is a lot of museums just can't actually afford to, like a lot of smaller museums that get robbed can't actually afford to put in that level of security. Right. Um, right. So it it may be, like, I don't even think that exists at the Louvre. And we're talking like, you know, some of the world's most famous pieces of art. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think we should be clear from the start going forward that it's not just uh, paintings. No, that no. are stolen. It's a statuary. It's antiquities. It yep. was even. I was reading a case about a uh, Stradivarius that was stolen. Oh, oh. God, yeah, yeah. Arche- sure. There's a huge problem in the U.S. with archaeological sites and burials, all the cultural property, and people just will go and dig them up, thinking, oh, "Look, I got all this stuff. I'm just going to sell it." And it's like you're actually you're damaging someone's culture never mind the monetary value of it Mm -hmm. oh yeah absolutely so so it's not like that and as far as you know the billionaire playboy type who just wants all the paintings for themselves um out of the more than a hundred thousand works stolen each year i've only found one example of um he's not even a billionaire he just he just wanted the paintings um he went and he actually stole a bunch of paintings and got he didn't actually get very um i think he got like 24 months in prison um just because he didn't sell them he just wanted them for himself <laughs> wow. but hold on hold on how he, many a year um over a hundred thousand individual work stolen each year um worldwide work- worldwide yeah and that's, it's worth- that's astonishing i would never have guessed it was that high it's worth about nearly six billion U.S. dollars a year. Holy crap! Billion. Wow, it's billion. That's not a mistake. That's not million. That's billion. Um, and it's the third largest um, criminal activity outside of uh, drugs and weapons. And so I don't have to learn gymnastics. I'm switching it industries. <laughs> <laughs> I watch that movie again because that scene really is just beautiful watching him dance through the lasers but no completely fiction cool you know with the uh, that was that was the, the thing that was stopping me <laughs> what, oh, was it? yeah what you can't do the dance moves right uh, <laughs> 
Well, there was a scene where it showed him doing almost a kata. He would practice a kata every day out in his, you know, the guy, the French guy, the 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 the, the little bad guy in the Oceans movie. Yeah. He would show him doing this, this kata outside in his beautifully wonderful millionaire mansion, and then it ends up that he practiced this kata so that he could specifically go through all the laser beams and not get hurt. So. It's a nice scene. It's very, it's fictional. It's completely yeah. fictional, but it's beautiful to watch. Yeah. <laughs> yep. There's, uh, yep. So there's a worldwide more than 100,000 works stolen each year, worth nearly six billion U.S. dollars. Um, from, from yeah. yeah, from everywhere. And there are. We'll talk about it later. There are um, organizations, like police organizations and groups, um, set up all over the world to try and stop it and recover the artworks and things like that. And basically out of everything that's stolen, only about, you know, just under 10% is ever actually recovered. Wow. So that's, there's, there's a lot. Sad. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Um, that, that sentence really honestly kind of makes sense to me in this country. I did. Maybe it's wrong to call art theft a white collar crime. It's not, because it's a actual. It's a theft of actual objects. Yeah, that could be one of the myths out there. People thinking of it as white collar. Well, it's a crime. Yeah, and it's certainly not a victimless crime. Obviously, because you're right. you're taking something. A possession that belongs to somebody else. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, but I just it... wonder if that perception is what got him, you know, two years in the pen. Well, he actually, just let me, uh, he actually, his name was, um, I was going to get into him later. He, it's one of the more famous um, art thefts. He, his name is Stefan Breitweiser. He's a French art thief, and between 1995 and 2001, he actually stole 239 pieces worth $1.4 billion. Wow. Yeah, and, he, and, and he would just, like, set a Renoir up on his kitchen table while he's having his cornflakes? Yeah, yeah, he stole them all for himself. So he got 26 months in jail. Um, it was basically considered a slap on the wrist, but it, because he, he didn't try to sell them to anybody. He just wanted them for himself. And that's the only example... Um, I could find of anybody who did it for themselves. In fact, um, when the police were actually closing in on him, um, he used his girlfriend as a lookout when he was actually stealing these things. Bad idea. And he, his mom was involved, apparently. She also knew that he had been stealing the stuff. And when the police started closing in, his mom started chucking it all into the river. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. What? Because <laughs> didn't, he didn't want his poor son to be caught with the merchandise. So oh, my God. And just started chucking all the paintings in. Um, and the girlfriend apparently chucked a few play, a few pieces into the Seine as well. So it was just it was just one of the one of the more ridiculous things. But we do have some pretty ridiculous stories to go through tonight. Um, that should I, be extra time on the <laughs> sentencing for throwing out that art. It's crazy, yeah. Like I said, it's it's the number. It's the it's the third highest crime worldwide, um, like criminal activity. Um, but I want to I want to go back a little bit. I want to sort of go through a little story about a very famous piece of art that everybody knows about. So it'll be a nice easy one. And it basically kicked off the whole art theft sort of thing. Um, it was when the Mona Lisa was stolen. So in 1911, the Mona Lisa was stolen from the Louvre. And it has, um, has, has everybody seen this painting? Uh, I'm not seeing it yet. I might be lagging. <laughs> no, but I mean, in ever seen it in a person, have oh, you? Not that I want to brag, but yeah, quite a few times. <laughs> I have been to Paris, I've been to the Louvre. I love the Louvre, it's wonderful there. Um, but at the time, the Louvre wasn't it wasn't the place that it is now, it wasn't. Um, there weren't a lot of people there. Um, basically, all of the guards were retired soldiers and pensioners. Um, hardly anybody visited it. it. There were a lot of older men. They were actually known for falling asleep at the job. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, and in 1911, hardly anybody knew what the Mona Lisa, or who the Mona Lisa was. Um, it was pretty much just this nice painting by this Italian guy. 
and that's pretty much anybody knew about it. So in in 11, it was um, on the 21st of August. Um, someone snuck in fairly early, came in a side door, um, walked in, took the took the painting off the wall, um, went down to a staircase, took the painting out of the um, frame, and tried to get out another side door. Couldn't manage that because for some reason I don't know he he tried to take the doorknob off, and then someone else spotted him. So he stuffed the painting under his jacket. And <laughs> at this point, he, he couldn't get up to the door was locked. So he actually took a little screwdriver that he had with him and he removed the doorknob. I, I don't know why. And then someone else caught him. So he just sat himself down on the, yeah, the painting you can see there is, that's where the Mona Lisa used to be displayed, like just with a bunch of other paintings. Um, wow. So he's sitting on the stairs as this other guy comes by and the other guy says, hey, how are you? Uh, why is there no doorknob here? And the thief goes, oh, well, you know, I don't know. I just got here myself. So the second guy walks through, locks the door again. The thief is still stuck inside. He can't get out that way. So basically he walks back the way he came, still carrying the Mona Lisa, um, this time without its frame. He walked by a sleeping guard. Hmm. Like he, right, by, right by a sleeping guard. They weren't even in booths or anything. The poor guy was just asleep in his chair. He walked right by him and out a side door, and that was it, left. Oh, my word. My word. Um, because, <laughs> uh, because the Mona Lisa wasn't famous, and you can see it's it's kind of you know shoved into a gallery with a bunch of other stuff, no one noticed it for, um, like, hours, completely oh hours. Oh, my goodness. Um, and the only reason it got discovered was nearly 24 hours later was because there was this other guy who used to do, another painter who used to do... Um, uh, copies of paintings for for customers. He wasn't, you know, he, he was he was legit. He just he he just had a business where he'd go in and just do copies for people who wanted famous right. paintings. And he came to finish a painting. He started one of the Mona Lisa. And he came and he's like, okay, where's the Mona Lisa? And he goes and asks a guard, and the guard's like, mm, I don't know. So he just he goes and checks, and he goes, oh yeah, the Mona Lisa's missing. Um, <laughs> and the time like no one. Like I said, everybody just didn't know. The painting wasn't famous at all. It wasn't worth nearly as much as it is now. So it was just a well-organized, systematic. The guy just walked in. He knew um, when, I don't know, I guess he knew when the guards would be asleep. I don't know. They, they just guess, had a or he just waited or something? Yeah, he just he went in at about 7.30 in the morning, and by 8, he was gone. Like he, It took 20 minutes. Wow. So the, the, the case was turned over to... Um, and nobody person. noticed this guy had a painting under his jacket. No, no one noticed. And no one noticed the painting was gone for like 24 hours. It's crazy. Um, so they turned to this guy called Louis Lapine, who was the most important policeman in France at the time. He was basically the Sherlock Holmes of his day. He was one of the founders of modern French policing. He introduced um, like forensic science and fingerprinting and all that kind of stuff. He was one of the first people um, in the world to actually use mm -hmm. And he started investigating and he started with, OK, how hard is it to get this painting off the wall? So they, they did a fake painting. They put it up on the wall in exactly the same way. And he had some of his men try to take it off. And they took like, I don't know, I think it was 14 minutes to get the painting off the wall. And then one of the guards came by and he said, oh, well, you kind of have to know the trick. So one of the guards who worked that came up and took it off within seconds because there was a trick to actually pulling it off the wall. Yeah. So they reckon that, okay, so someone must someone have known knew. how to take it off the wall properly. Otherwise, right. they would have been, you know, struggling with it. So they found a fingerprint because at the time, thieves didn't wear gloves because they, fingerprinting wasn't a thing. So they didn't really care about leaving their fingerprints all over the place. True. Um, he found a fingerprint. Um, but the problem was that Lapine had 750,000 cards with fingerprints on them. And it would have taken like months, if not years, to check every single one. But then when they did this, um, they started sort of profiling. So that's when this little experiment yeah. came. So they reckoned, okay, so <laughs> it's someone in the museum because they know how to take the painting off the wall. But the other thing is he was very, very biased. And he didn't think it was stolen by someone, like a lower class person. They thought it must be um, a highly skilled international team of art thieves um, it must be, you know, <laughs> someone who is very classy, very suave, very sophisticated, um, because why would someone who's not sophisticated want a piece of art? It, it just didn't occur to him 
that you know non upper class people would want a piece of art it always really gets me when people don't go to the occam's razor yeah, yeah. well that's that's, that's yeah that's one of the significance uh significances it's one of the things about this particular case that Afterwards, it, it, it changed the way that um, both crime is investigated and the way that art thieves view the art world. Um, so, so they tested all the art, um, the people inside the museum, um, and no one came up. It wasn't the, the fingerprint didn't match. So they figured, OK, maybe one of our subcontractors. Um, there had been some subcontractors in that had worked on specialist framing for some of the some of the paintings. And they um, tested all those people and they tested everybody. And one guy didn't show up and they went, ah, okay. So this guy didn't show up. Let's go and visit him. And they went to visit him. His name was, um, he's 29 year old. His name was Vincenzo Perugia. And they went to visit him and he had like a small little grovelly place. It was, you know, horrible and rats and cockroaches. And he was um, just like a, a, an Italian migrant worker. He wasn't well educated. He was very poor. Um, he was already known to the police um, he had been arrested for um, theft and assaulting a prostitute with a knife, and he spent days in prison. Um, and he was the only suspect they have, so they grudgingly sent a junior officer to his place. And basically, the guy, they, they just didn't think this guy, he was too lower class to be an art th th uh, thief. So they took a look around his place and went, no, it cannot be this guy. And left. <laughs> um <laughs> The, the thing is that the Mona Lisa was wrapped in a, a, a piece of cloth sitting on the table as the policeman was actually there. Are you kidding me? Well. He, th he threw a towel over it. Yeah. Nope, no painting here. Nope. Nope, I'm just an oppressor of women. Yeah. Don't look for any paintings here. He had an alibi. Um, there was lots of finger pointing in the press at this point. Most of the world knew about it. Um, the French were furious because this wasn't, this was someone who had stolen a piece of their identity. So, this is where the cultural element comes in. So, never mind how much the painting was worth because it wasn't worth nearly what it is today. It was not famous. I have to keep reminding people of that. Um, they, they just didn't think he was just too low class to have stolen this thing. So, a few weeks after the, um, after the theft, Paris um, newspapers started offering rewards. They started with, um, what would be about one and a half million USD today. So they offered a lot of money for to get this painting back. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't because the painting was worth so much um, as it was a cultural thing. It was such an insult to France that someone could dare walk into the Louvre and steal a piece of art. I'm going to venture a guess that this wasn't the first time they'd been stolen from. <laughs> well, that's the funny thing. Um, so as they were looking for the Mona Lisa, some guy came forward, um, this Belgian guy called Joseph, Joseph Jerry Piret, and he said, oh, yeah, it's easy to steal from, stuff from the Louvre. I do it all the time. <laughs> he's like, and he's like, oh, yeah, like I pretty much do it to order. Like, you tell me what you want. I'll go in and take it. <laughs> he just walks up and admits it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and apparently he has... That's hilarious. So he would he would just go to the Louvre, come home with objects from the Louvre that he just picked up and stuck in his pockets. Um, <laughs> and, and some of the objects were these Iberian head statues, which he had sold to Picasso, the you know the artist. So the police actually visited Picasso because he's the oh, type of guy who yeah. would steal it. Yeah. I yeah, think I've was, heard the, about that. Yeah, that they he, accused he, him of being yeah. in on it. So they thought, yeah, it's got to be this guy because he's upper class, he's sophisticated, he's exactly the type of person we're profiling, still not realizing that anybody can steal art. Um, so they went and they, they had him questioned, and they actually found the Iberian head statues because he actually still had them. Um, and he got sort of a slap on the wrist for having stolen you know, merchandise from the Louvre. Um, so he gave that back. He actually used it in his art. He didn't really want it. He didn't try to sell it. He just wanted it because um, he wanted to use it in some of his art. So um, if you're familiar with Picasso, the name of the painting is La Dame de Avignon. It, that's anyway. Um, uh, anyway. Uh, yeah. So they weren't, <laughs> able to, they weren't able to build a case. So eventually 
it, it became a cold, pay, a cold case. It got moved off the front page. Um, Lapine retired in 1913, so that's two years after it was stolen, um, without having solved it. So, um, in the meantime, so after about 28 months after it disappeared, um, this art dealer from Florence um, gets a letter from someone who calls himself Leonard V. And this guy says, I have the Mona Lisa in my possession. Um, I want to sell it at a 25% discount because, you know, you're Italian and I'll, I'll give it to you for, you know. And they they get a guy in from the Uffizi Museum. Um, it's kind of the, the Italian version of the Louvre. And they agree and they agree to pay a finder's fee of uh, 500,000 lira, which is about just over half a million U.S. dollars. Whoa. The guy, so the guy pulls out a case from under the bed um, and he starts taking out all this weird stuff from this case. He takes out paintbrushes, a mandolin, shoes, um, just weird stuff. And then the case has a false bottom. There's an object wrapped in red velvet, the same red velvet that was in the, when they went to the, um, what's his face, is the, uh, the Italian guy uh, whose name is now just escaped. What is his name? Oh, yeah, Perugia. Um, so it ends up this guy is, is actually Perugia. And he wants to sell the painting back, but he wants, you know, he, he's willing to offer a discount. And so he says to them, okay, well, you can take it away and take a look at it, and I'll just wait here. And so they take it away. They figure out, yeah, it actually is the Mona Lisa. Um, and then instead of obviously giving him the reward, they send the police to his place, and he gets arrested. Huh. He's... So this is over two years, so the thing's been missing for two years. In the meantime, it's been in all the international newspapers. Um, in fact, there was an American news, it's, but it's so little known that an American newspaper prints Mona Lisa Stolen, but they actually put a picture of the wrong painting. Because they, didn't, <laughs> they didn't know what Mona Lisa wow. was. It's good you, to know it, journalism has maintained its standards. <laughs> it's, it's so weird to me that they that there was a time when the Mona Lisa wasn't like in everybody's consciousness because it's one right. of the most common images these days um but anyway they they um yeah when they had visited him it was like feet it was a couple of feet away from the policeman as he visited his they're calling it one of the biggest police mistakes in history because it was wrapped in this red cloth on the table um they refused to believe he could be responsible they didn't even fingerprint him at that point it was it was crazy um so they were like why like why would this guy steal it like He's not the right, we don't think he's the right type of person. He's not the right class. He's too poor. He's too, he's an immigrant, etc. He basically stole it because um, Italians were the largest single foreign population in Paris at the time. And they did all the jobs that the French didn't want. And as a result, they were treated very badly. Like his, he had his food spit in and he had stuff spilled on him and he was insulted in the streets. And Italians just weren't treated very well. So this guy would walk around the Louvre seeing all these Italian paintings that were in a French museum and going, well, geez, I, you know, that's not fair. These shouldn't be here. This is Italian art. It should be in Italy. Oh. Um, and a lot of the work in the Louvre was stolen by Napoleon. And, you know, he, he was so offended by this, that, you know, this great Italian art, they treat us so terribly, but they worship our arts. That's not fair. So I'm going to steal this and take it back to Italy it was basically. Oh, he thought, he, he thought it had been stolen from Italy. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, he he did he did have okay. Despite the craziness of they treat you know uh, this should be back in Italy. Um, it actually Napoleon stole a lot and put it in the Louvre, but he did not steal the Mona Lisa. So he was wrong. That's one of the pieces that Napoleon did not steal. Um, but back in Italy, he was actually seen as a patriot, not a thief. Um, they refused to extradite him to France. He was tried in an Italian court. He was sentenced to 12 months, but he only served seven, which is basically a, a slap on the wrist, because a lot of Italians at the time thought the same thing. There's all this, all, all of our art is in, is in France, all of our people are treated so badly in France, we should have this art back. Um, so the impact of this base, so they got the Mona Lisa back and, it, and they decided um, to maybe put a little bit more security on it. But the, the impact of this is, it's one of the first or if not the first major art theft. So now that everybody around... Except for the Belgian guy. If it fits in my pocket, I'm taking it. <laughs> uh, so basically what it did was it opened up 
the possibility to other people that, oh, we can steal art too. Um, so the impact was it started a chain of uh, sort of a chain of events um, internationally um, that, wow, art can now be stolen. The other thing it did was um, the Mona Lisa was now famous. Um, it was now an international icon. Everybody and all these thieves realize, oh, we can steal art too. Um, in, let's see, in 1953, the Mona Lisa was valued at $100 million. The value of it today, and again, this is, I, I kid you not, 3.5 billion US dollars. Do you wow. think somebody would actually pay that? No, no. And it's just, no. <laughs> no, um, I don't either. It's, it's crazy. It's, it's Somebody paid something for a crystal skull not that long ago. Yeah, well, uh, there are a lot of them. Um... Was it Indiana Joneses? <laughs> <laughs> no, I forget what they exactly call it, but it was literally a skull made out of crystals. What yeah, are those... those are there are there are archaeological artifacts like that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But it, well, it... this one, this wasn't an artifact; it was a piece of art. Oh, okay. That somebody made. Well, it, there's there's statues, there's paintings, there's like everything is stolen. Everything that you put in a museum is basically up for grabs if you're a good thief. Um, so basically, that changed the face of crime. Art theft now became the third highest grossing criminal trade after drugs and arms trade, and it's worth you know four billion or sorry, yeah, uh, you know six billion pounds a year. Um, so basically, because of that one crime, now it, it cha just changed everything. One, the Mona Lisa became super famous. Two, um, the investigative techniques changed because then they started doing profiling and fingerprinting and forensics. And three, art became one of the ways that criminals could make money. Man, I'm still a little weirded out about that with Picasso. He's one of my all-time favorite painters. He's, yeah, he, and I, I guess... He must have thought because they were Iberian statues in his background, um, he must have thought it was okay for him to keep this stolen art. I don't, I don't know. I just, but yeah, when the police came to visit him, they they kind of went through his cupboards and found the statues. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. I, I understand he was, and I can't remember where I came across this. But he was pretty um, offended that they thought he would steal the Mona Lisa. Well. Yeah, um, but the, the other thing is, is that they, because they didn't think, because they didn't, you know, think that anybody would steal a piece of art, they thought only upper class, you know, people would steal it. He seemed like the perfect candidate. You know, it's interesting because we were talking about, um, uh, the Yorkshire Ripper and the police assumptions that allowed that to continue for so long and it's to me it's yep. it's the same type of mentality oh all these women are prostitutes therefore it's only prostitutes that get that this uh person is interested in um and, and that I can, kind of, I can kind of see that because they're following a pattern like at least they've got evidence yes these however many women are prostitutes therefore like i can kind of see the logic there but just to assume that lower class people can't possibly enjoy art, they can't possibly know anything about art, they can't possibly right. enjoy, there's no way a lower class person would even be, you know, caught dead in a museum, never mind stealing stuff. It, it just, it, it was just like, wow. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that basically cut off most of the population, <laughs> like, because how many people were walking around like that at the time? Well, I suppose there are quite a few millionaires, but still, it, I don't know, it just... That is a new level of tunnel vision. Yeah, seriously. On the part of the police. This is the one, like the one of the most famous French policemen at the time. I mean, he did do an awful lot of good work with the forensics and stuff like that because he applied it all. It, he didn't just use all of this for the Mona Lisa. He did it for all of, uh, you know, all the parts of his work. Um, so he really did do a lot to change the sort of like the face of detective work. But yeah, the the assumptions he made with this were just wildly inaccurate wow and you know 
uh, if I can call back to the beginning when we were talking about, you know, drug dealers, you know, stealing uh, art for their private collections, personal use type of things. Back in the 80s, in the media, you know, in the movies, it was the Japanese who were the uh, instigators of that kind of art theft. Yeah. Yeah. So it's whoever is the uh, cultural bad guy of the moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When in fact, it's it's like I said, I could only find one example of this guy that wanted for himself. So just to maybe to address the, the ridiculous value of some of this art, um, I thought I might go through a few. Why is this art? Why is it worth so much? Like it's OK. Like some of the some of the the mm-hmm. values of some of this stuff are almost obscene, and it, it, you just wonder. Um, so, basically, what makes art expensive? Like what makes it you know so worth so much? Um, basically, um, authenticity. So a real Monet, for example, is going to be worth more than a fake one, obviously. Hopefully. The provenance. So basically, this is a piece. You know, the Mona Lisa piece that. Um, they can follow right through from its original, you know, the original art right through to whoever owns it now. And if you've got a trail like that with no cuts, it's going to be worth more than, say, you know, someone painted it and then there's a 50 year gap and we don't know what happened to it and then it resurfaced right. again. And so a lot can happen in that 50 years. People can copy them, they could be that kind of thing. True. Um, well, and then you also have the, uh, variable of auctions in there well yeah Um, yeah there's well there's that yeah that comes into it so it's basically how much do people want to pay for it so um right like the market value of it so basically um yeah so those things there's the condition of it basically the better the condition the better the more it'll be worth um the historical significance if it's got uh, if it's a major player in the canon of art history, it's going to have a bunch of zeros on the end, like the Mona Lisa. Um, the popularity of the artist is, I mean, Da Vinci's just, you know, top of the top pretty much, isn't he? Like, right. if, you know, who wouldn't want a Da Vinci in their living room? Who doesn't I know, I have know. one? Oh, well, I know. I know that I, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't mind a few more. <laughs> I've been thinking about getting the Vitruvian man tattooed on my wrist. <laughs> I love Vitruvian. I, yeah. I like doing yeah. I like doing Vitruvian other like I did a Vitruvian snowman for Christmas and You, you know Wes, <laughs> if you did it on his elbow he could do crunches. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I was hoping to finish my sleeves that I've got going. Ah. So I'm going to have to do the elbow or the back of my arm. Oh, the inside of your arm's going to hurt. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, tattoos are addictive in that way. Endorphins? You, yeah, the endorphin rush after you get one. I don't know. I had a bit of alcohol before I got a couple of mine, so there wasn't so much endorphins as many. <laughs> <laughs> just as fun um yeah. what else makes a painting a painting worth money um if the artist is alive or not i mean that's kind of the 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 long-running joke that's maybe not a joke is that an artist's work is worth more after they die yeah yeah that's it's well it also also well it it depends on how many paintings they've already done and as well when they're dead, they can't do any more. So yeah, all of their stuff, you know, goes up in value. Um, there's also, there's also something called typicality. So when you look at a Picasso painting, um, one of his later things, like his cubist paintings, for example, um, will probably be worth more than his early stuff because people associate him with a particular style of art, like the cubism. So, but he did a lot of other styles. Uh, yeah, he did a lot of other stuff as well, but because he's most familiar and most known for a particular style of art, that style will be worth more um, than some of the like if like a, a farm painting mm. by him as opposed to one of his cubist paintings. Um, the backstory of the artist will actually make the make a difference. So if the artist has an interesting backstory, apparently that makes um, that makes the painting worth more. 
um, with the medium, how they painted it, the oil paintings tend to be more valuable than um, like sketches or watercolors or, or prints, obviously. Um, at, something I found interesting when I was researching, apparently color comes into it. So paintings that contain the color red, for example, always cost more. Mm. I thought it was very, I don't know, it seems to be very subjective, the color. But anyway, that's one of them. Um, the subject matter, sunnier landscapes are worth more than gloomy storms and, you know, things like that. Um, there's something called wall power, like how it's going to look on a wall. It's kind really? of difficult. It's kind of difficult to quantify, but, you know, does it shock you? Does it inspire awe when you look at it? Is it, you know, that sort of thing. Um, all of those things will, you know, elevate the price. You know, that red thing is also true on a car lot. Yeah, I, I, I don't understand. I don't know why. Maybe red is, I don't know, it's bright and it's exciting, but it's also the color of blood. So it yeah. weighs, I don't know, That's it's pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. um so basically that's what um in the comments oh, yeah. michelle says red is also more expensive color to make and it purchase used, it was actually blue that was more expensive to make oh really yeah blue was um one of the most well depending on the type of blue um it depend, and it also depends on the period you go through. But red was yeah red was very 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 valuable for example there's something called pompeii red which is, um, if you look at the walls of Pompeii where the, you know, Vesuvius erupted and they oh, started, yeah. yeah. If you look at some of the walls, there's a Pompeii red, and that was super, super expensive. So only the richest people had that. But then when you start getting into, um, like, the medieval period and the Renaissance, the blues were very, very expensive. So, um, um, like, da Vinci and, and Rembrandt, they when they used the blues, because of the mineral they used, um, it was quite a rare mineral they used to make the blues, then that would be more expensive. So it kind of depends on the time period. There's also something called Egyptian blue, which um, blue was more expensive back in Egyptian times because of the way that it was made. And then, yeah, it just depends on the culture and the time period. But yeah, it's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that makes this, but it's it's just market value. Now, having said that, no one's going to pay, what did we say the Mona Lisa was worth? Like, One point something yeah. billion yeah, like, no one, I I don't know, I just, does <laughs> I mean, if you're the Louvre, wouldn't you want to at least find out, you know, is does Jeff Bezos want to have this, you know, in his kitchen? Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that's a lot of money. <laughs> it's a huge amount of money. But the interesting thing, yeah. the reason I started with this, um, this particular story is not only because it changed the, the criminality um, of art, like, you know, oh, now everybody can steal it. Um, there's actual value for criminals in stealing art um, in terms of it being not only just worth the money, but they can use it as collateral. And we'll get into a few examples. Collateral? Um, of that. Right. Like, yeah. like in uh, to trade it for something or against uh, a loan or that kind of collateral or um, prosecute prosecute you know in their in their defense yeah. if they get caught yeah. yeah yeah exactly so just to give an example we're i'll go through um a little bit later but um there were a couple of van gogh paintings stolen in february of 2017 and they were basically um worth i think 30 million dollars us there were two of them and was one of them the home alone picture <laughs> this is my sophistication level <laughs> well, that's, that's, the really weird thing is is that they weren't famous paintings at all oh they okay. were just yeah they weren't even so the, the thieves walked in um they stole two paintings and they were worth money they were small but they weren't the most famous paintings they could have stole so it was it was it was kind of an odd choice, but anyway, they they were worth about thirty million dollars, um, and then they ended up in the hands of the the Camorra, the um, basically the the mafia in Naples. Oh, and okay. what what happens in Italy is okay. So basically, paintings um, are you can have them for insurance. So a painting um, is worth in the criminal world, it's worth roughly ten percent of what the market value is. So if you've got a painting that's worth a hundred million dollars market value, it's worth ten million dollars as collateral. Oh. So, 
So if you're a criminal and you're like, okay, well, I, I owe you drug money here. Take this painting. It's worth, you know, gotcha. $10 million. I'll get you the rest of the drugs next week and I'll take the painting back. But at least you've got something that's worth something. Right. Um, the other interesting thing so is... So you don't, that, like, cut my tongue out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the other interesting thing is, and there's little quirks like this all around the world, is in Italy, um, if you if you have these paintings and you get arrested for anything... And let's say you get a 20 year jail sentence. Um, there's a clause that says if you give back any artwork or anything cultural that you might have that, you know, back to back to Italy, then we'll cut years off your sentence. Ha ha ha. So they use it for that as well. Um, and the other weird thing is. So did covered. the mafia put that law into place? <laughs> you know, it was actually the police. They're so the Italians are so um, passionate about their art that they will be willing to cut your sentence, uh, you know, up up to in half just to get the artwork back for the country. And if you turn in a, a French piece of art, they'll add years. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't want that. That doesn't count. <laughs> Actually, I'm not sure how that works. That would be interesting to look up whether whether like a a foreign country's painting still counts, but I definitely know that if it's like an Italian. Well, actually, no. Um, these these there's there's a criminal that had these two Van Goghs, and he managed to get some. He like he said he had them, and they managed to you know he wanted to negotiate to get some time off. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Van Goghs were stolen from the Van Gogh Museum, not Italy. So I guess it counts for anybody's paintings, just. You know, okay. if we got some okay. from another culture. Um, it's, there's another quirky thing in Holland I'll just bring up. If you if you steal artwork or you steal something and you've you've held it for 20 years and not been caught, then technically it's yours. You get to keep it. It's like squatting. It's just homesteading it's, on art. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's so weird. Some of these, and that's a massive loophole that I just I I can't believe is still in place. Wow. Um. So let's see. The most expensive robbery ever actually happened in Boston, surprisingly. I was. Oh uh, uh, yeah, I think hmm. I've heard of this. This is the um, the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. And we have a picture of that. Yeah, I think we have a, the outside. So basically, um, Isabel Stewart Gardner was a uh, like a Boston socialite, and she collected tons of art. Um, and in 1990, it was um, St. Patrick's Day celebrations were going on. It was the 18th of March. And there's tons of noise and tons of, you know, parties and stuff like that in the area. And two men, dressed as policemen, knocked on the door of the museum and said, oh, we, we're responding to a call. And the guard inside figured, oh, it must be partiers must have, you know, got in somehow or they must have, I don't know, tried to knock out a window or something. So against regulations, this guy let the policeman in. Um, the policeman ended up not being policeman. What? Um, they tied him up. They knew that there was only one other guard in the building. They waited until he actually came down and did his rounds and came down the stairs. And when he came down the stairs, they tied him up. And then they spent 81 minutes stealing 13 pieces um, worth $600 million dollars. Now or then? Uh, now. Okay. So this is. Um, that's, that's, so this is. That's still good. That's good change. Yeah. Yeah, it's apparently it, it is the most um, the most expensive art heist ever. They took um, a Van Gogh. They took um, a, a famous Vermeer um, called the Concert. Um, it it was worth. Let's see, one hundred million dollars for the Van Gogh. The Vermeer alone was worth three hundred million dollars, um, and then there were thirteen pieces in total. Now, there's a bunch of theories on who did what and who who they were and everything, but um, the thing is that these pieces have never been recovered. Really, none of them. Yeah, there's still there's still a case open. Um, let's see if I can find. I've got a note. And what here. year was this again? Remind me. Nine. Uh, sorry, I'm inside out. Sorry, I can't even read. Um, 1990. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Thirty years. 
Yeah. If it was Holland, they'd be scot free. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, and no one actually knows where they are. So there's still, um, like, I think the 2000 page file still. Oh, no, that was that was something else. Or that's the Gantel. Um, no, they still they still haven't found anything. There are a few theories, um, one of which is Mafia, Mob Associates. Um, they reckon that there's a couple of guys that were facing the joint. Um, they were a bunch of trees. Um, the they were always up in the trees. And then before they could actually break in, one guy got arrested for something else. And his two colleagues, he reckons his two colleagues did it. Hmm. And when, when asked, well, what happened to your colleague? One died of a heart attack, and the other one ended up beaten up, headless, in the trunk of the car. <laughs> so, yeah. The FBI still has a uh, reward of 65 million dollars oh, for information it's up to 65 that's cool i'm yeah. gonna i have to put the fbi's art crime logo yeah. up because it's astonishing to me that yeah. a group dedicated to art can have such an awful looking logo <laughs> it is yeah, horrendous it's pretty bad it is really yeah it you would have thought they maybe could have got an artist to maybe. <laughs> it looks like someone did it with Photoshop. I mean, come on. Oh, the colors are terrible. It just, they just, the, yeah. It's just, just a mess. I guess they thought they were really, they wanted some sort of impact. Like we do all types of art. <laughs> Cram as much art. You can't as even, circle. it's Possible. unreadable. It's just terrible. We act. <laughs> Five, six, seven, eight. Looks like there's about nine paintings shoved into the center of that circle. That's hilarious. Um, yeah, so there's various theories about what happened at the um, the Gardner Museum. One of the more interesting ones is um, one of the guards. He's a 23-year-old guard. His name is Richard of Bath. And it, the weird thing is, it, like, he was never arrested, but he often showed up at work um, either completely drunk or completely stoned. Um, he... The motion sensor showed that um, the thieves never entered one area where uh, one of the paintings of Manet was stolen. Only Abath was on his rounds, and he went oh. in that area. So that's very weird. That is weird. Um, mm. There's also evidence that he opened a side door shortly before opening it again for the for the fake officers. Um, and 24 hours earlier. He was seen letting some unauthorized men in the museum at night. Um, he was known for letting his friends into party. <laughs> and why they, not? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I got some great things, yeah. Um, but, the, yeah, the day before, he actually was seen letting strangers in. So it, it's, I don't know. I, if I had to go with anybody, I think I would go with him. Is this um, the one where they didn't go upstairs where all the really valuable stuff was that they missed a whole bunch of things that were just even more valuable or is that a different story i think that's a different one that might have been okay. the van gogh okay. one because they those guys did they passed by one of the sun the paintings of the sunflowers uh, um they, uh, they passed by the painting of there's a very famous painting of um of van gogh with his hat on and like just the red hair and it's and they passed by those ones completely and took these two smaller ones. It's um, it's just very weird. Um, another theory about the Gardner Museum, um, there was this California screenwriter who used to work in Boston. Um, his name was Brian um, McDevitt. And he was involved in a bungled New York City sort of, I'm uh, oh, sorry, a New Year's Eve um, robbery. It has similar style. Him and a friend, that FedEx truck. Um, in 1980, they stole the uniforms, um, and then when they were caught, they had duct tape and tools to cut paintings from them. But the first got to the museum because they got stuck. In the I'm and sorry, they... you're cutting out a little bit. Um, he was still in Boston during this, so the fact that he they took uniforms from a FedEx guy, they had duct tape, they had tools to cut paintings, it seems highly suspicious. So I wanted to uh, 
one of the other myths, or I guess uh, movie tropes, it more like, is um, thieves cutting paintings out of their frames in order to be quick. Oh, they do that. Yeah, no, that's not. That, that's, that's a real thing? That's a real thing, yeah. Oh, geez. Yeah. <clears throat> now, the Mona Lisa, he had enough time because the guards were sleeping to actually take the whole thing off the wall, but he took it out of the frame properly um, down in a staircase. But, you know, a lot, what a lot of people will do is they'll actually just take knives and just cut them out because it's... Now, doesn't that damage? The, I mean, it's it's that's an awful thing to do. Oh, terrible! <laughs> I just when I think about it, like, oh god. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's it's quicker, and you can roll the painting up, and usually, you know, carry it out a lot easier than you've seen some of those paintings. Well, I I was hoping that was a fake thing from Hollywood. Sorry, no, that's that's actually a true thing. It's actually one of the most efficient ways of feeling a painting. <laughs> Not that I'm giving people mm -hmm. ideas or hints or tips or anything, but yeah. <laughs> Kids, next time you visit a museum, take a knife with you. <laughs> <laughs> see if you can get it through the metal detector. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Well, see, that's the, that's the thing. Now, because of the Mona Lisa, because it not only kicked off the, the, the art festival, it also kicked off the, oh, geez, we better get some more security in here world, in the museums. Uh, so uh. so that's when they started taking it a little bit more seriously. So the knock-on effect was, okay, so this painting was stolen. The criminals thought, oh, we can steal this. Let's steal some more art. Oh, the museums are like, oh, people are now stealing art. We have to do something about this. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is that some of the smaller museums still don't have insurance or anything. They just can't afford it. Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> 100,000 pieces a year would indicate that, no, they can't. Yeah, I know. And some of the, I mean, when you steal a, a billion-dollar painting, I mean, what insurance company is going to, you know, insure you for, like, $6 billion or whatever? Right. Yep. So, yeah, that's... Um, so let's see, we went through Mona Lisa. What makes a painting valuable? Most expensive one. Do you want to know the most stolen painting in the world? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so this isn't counting. Not the Mona enough. Lisa, because that was no, only stolen not, once. <laughs> that was only stolen once, no. Um, the Ghent Altarpiece by Van Eyck. It was done in the 1420s. And it's been stolen, I think, six times. <laughs> um, and that's that's not including the Nazis. They they took it as well, which will I think we're doing a Nazi show and you know. yeah, yeah. Wow. The the yeah. Nazis were so prolific at stealing art; they deserve their own episode. Yep. It just yeah that yeah we'll we'll get into that because that's a huge huge topic. Um, but yeah, one of the one of the times it was stolen was in 1934. Um, there's 12 panels, I think. Yeah, there we go. So the panel, if you look at the, again, the picture that's on the screen right now, if you look on the bottom left-hand side, there's like a little panel with uh, some guys on horses. That's actually fake. Um, that's actually a reproduction because that panel, the original, is, has never been recovered. Oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was stolen in 1934, the 11th of April. Um, they went into the church and they saw it. And there are a bunch of people around it, like around just a huge crowd looking at this. And the police showed up. The police commissioner decided that um, it could wait because a cheese shop across the street had been robbed. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously the cheese shop is more important than this 1420s, you know, absolute. If you're in the art world, the, the Ghent altarpiece is one of the pieces that's known as one of the most, like, perfect pieces of art on the planet. Obviously. And cheese is obviously <laughs> more important than the most important piece of art on the planet. So. <laughs> wow. So, wow. yeah, he just decided to investigate um, the cheese shop and then went. Uh, this is reminding me. Every time I say cheese shop, I'm reminded of the Monty Python sketch now. <laughs> Um, so yeah, he, he just decided they were going to investigate that instead. Um, hmm. a, a few days later, a ransom demand followed for 1 million, um, Belgian francs, which I don't have the value for. I don't know if anybody can look that up. 795. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, $6 and 82 cents. 
Um, the thief returned, actually the thief stole two panels and he returned, um, actually there's three panels, and he actually returned two of the panels just to show that he was acting in good faith. Hmm. Um, hmm. And, and just said, basically, if you give me the rest of the money, you can have the, you can have the rest of it. Um, the money was not forthcoming. Um, it ended up at some point, a stockbroker, um, this guy called, um, I'm not very good with Belgian names, go, go dirt here. On his bed, on his deathbed, he said, "Oh, you know, go and check my table. There's a note over there." And when they looked, they found a whole bunch of carbon copies of the um, the ransom notes that had already been sent, plus another one that hadn't been sent. So uh, they don't know if he was involved in it or if he. But <laughs> one of the things that was written down in the unsent one, there was a clue, and the clue is this. So okay, so the clue is it rests in a place when neither I nor anybody else can take it away without arousing the attention of the public. So if Dan Brown wants to get on that, that <laughs> I, would, I would read that. You know, that guy in New Mexico, his treasure got all, found already. So let's work on this one. <laughs> but yeah, yep. In a place where neither I nor anybody else can take it away without arousing the attention of the public, which suggests that he's hidden it someplace Public. Like out the open or something, yeah. yeah. Um, one of the theories was there was a possible cover-up by the church. Um, apparently, one of the bishops got involved in a dodgy investment, um, and he lost a bunch of the church's money. So he um, stole the panel, and he wanted to ransom. He wanted to ransom the church to get the church's money back. Like I, just, I don't know how that works. It's, but anyway. Um, that that ended up not so going any. So steal from the church so you can pay the church back. With the church's money. With the church. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. There's been all kinds of theories about where it is. Nothing has come up. There's still to this day there is still an officer assigned to the case. Um, so mm -hmm. from 1934 when it was stolen, there is still someone looking into this. Um, oh. It's still an active case. There's a 2,000 page file on it. Um, they still follow up every single lead they can possibly get. Um, but some of the fun, something, some of the interesting things that had happened. So this, um, this stockbroker guy, um, Arsene Godertier, um, his skull, in 1995, his skull was illegally, um, excavated by an amateur detective. I, I, I don't know why, like, a, yeah. Maybe, all of this guy, it'll tell me something. Um, but someone else took the skull to hold a seance to ask the skull where the painting was. <laughs> <laughs> a seance! Why didn't we think of that? Wait, somebody thought of it. It must not have worked, obviously. Obviously not, no. And like I said, it's a 2,000-page file. The, the case is still open. They're still hopeful they'll find it. Um, they probably didn't consult a mystic, so it's that's a, why it didn't it's work. It's near water. <laughs> <laughs> I see the color it's blue. Out, it's, it's out in the open, though, because remember the clue. Yeah, a yeah. fountain. I hope, so, I hope someone does write that book, though. That's actually there was a, there was a theory that um, it was tucked away in the back of another church. Apparently. Um, I guess they got a, an anonymous clue when they went, and there was like a, a little panel behind, like where the organ was. And when you looked, it, like you're not allowed to go back there. It, it was just part of the church construction. But if you go back there, there was um, a piece of like a section of the wall that was the exact size mm. of the panel mm. from the altar piece. Really, and really? people are thinking it might have been stored there, and that's what the clue was talking about. Because there's no way you could get it out of the church without everybody noticing. Well, but they got it into the church without everybody noticing. Well, it's true. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe more people go to church these days. I don't know. Church is open late at night. You can't sneak in at night anymore. I'm not sure. Ah, um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm intrigued by the clue, though. I'm just I'm fascinated by that. It's a good mystery. That is, that is a good clue. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, it was, never, it was never recovered. So. Yeah, it definitely is a... Quite the tale. Well, uh, the whole skull thing and the seance is just, are you kidding me? People go to such lengths <laughs> and find these paintings. That is oh, yeah. 
Okay, so when you got you've got the clue and you've got the seance and the skull being dug up. Oh, come on, where is Dan Brown listening to this? Someone send this to him. This sounds this is right up. His- <laughs> right. Well, you could write well, it, Kelly. I well, I could. Maybe, maybe I could. Yeah. He wrote it beforehand. This time. I think- they're all they're all just peons in Dan Brown's world. <laughs> The problem with writing the book is there's no, <laughs> is there? There's no what? There's no ending. If you can't, if if the clues don't lead to a happy ending for people, then there's no ending to the book, is there? Unless they, unless they find it at some point. Well, I mean, that's no. Actually, the great part about there it still being lost is you can make it be whatever you want. Well, this is true, actually. Yeah, you might actually come up with the actual, you know, solve it inadvertently through fiction. <laughs> that would be kind of cool. Or even funner is you could lead a lot of uh, gullible people onto merry chases <laughs> <laughs> that go nowhere. Well, because of Dan Brown, people actually go on. I don't know if they still do them, but when Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code was was really popular, mm-hmm. there were tours mm-hmm. in the loo of like places from the book you could visit in so obviously the mona lisa and i think there was another painting mentioned that had a a message behind it um and there was a bathroom that one of the characters jumped out of to escape the museum and they would actually take you on a tour like this is the bathroom where they jumped out and this is the painting that had the writing on it and this is you know it's like oh god no so does (laughs) does a rose line actually go through the louvre no, I don't think so. I, don't I, don't I mean, <laughs> but it does in the movie. Yeah, and I don't think that what's her face is buried beneath the upside down pyramid. Like I just, <laughs> the, who is it? The Mary Magdalene? No, I don't. I've been there. I know she's not there. <laughs> well, Jimmy look, Hoffa's a, a, body is according to. Them, I remember. Lisa. Sorry, I keep stepping on you. Oh, no, I just said uh, Jimmy Hoffa's body is buried below the (laughs) Mona Lisa. There is. um, Dan Brown actually came out and said, look, this is a work of fiction. Yeah, I know. Yep, he did. And people don't believe him. (laughs) It's it's hilarious. Well, they think he said it because it's all a big cover up and he was forced to say it to get people off the, you know, off the track and stuff like this. It's like, it's just, it's crazy. It goes back to, there's a guy called Lincoln and I don't remember the other guy, Valent or something, who wrote a book called The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail. And it talks about the Merovingians and the bloodline of Christ and how there's a person walking around now who is a, the great, 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 whatever of Jesus Christ's brother or, or I don't know, I think maybe it was Jesus had an affair with Mary Magdalene and there's someone still walking around. And it was all it, it was all proven, like it was nonsense. It, it was interesting yeah. at the time. But they've since come out and said, oh, no, this is fake. This is fake. Oh, we made this up. Oh, yeah, we made this up as well. But no one believes them because it right. was just so compelling. It's just such an – it's so interesting that's, to think that – I mean, that's a good writer <laughs> if you can make people believe your fiction is not fiction. Well, these guys mm-hmm. have told it as nonfiction. Oh. Which was the interesting thing. Um, hang on. Well, well, you, you know, know that, I mean, the, the Cohen brothers said that uh, Fargo was a true story, and that was total bullshit. They were just pulling people's legs. Okay, I, just, I just happened to have a copy of The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, because of course I do. Of course and, you do. And the cover's actually, and it's illustrated as well. I've got pictures in here and everything. Um, it's by Michael Bajan, Richard Lee, and Henry Lincoln. And it came out in, oh, God, if you go through all of the quotes, it came out in 1982. Um, and it it talked about Ren, uh, Rennes-le-Chateau, which is the very famous church in, I think it's Scotland, that has all the weird stuff in it. Mm-hmm. It talks about Cathars and the, the mystery of the Cathars and monks and the Knights Templar and just... <laughs> The Prior de Sion, de Sion, and it just it, it goes on about all these conspiracies right. of the Merovingian. I just and it it's sold as a nonfiction book. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the weird thing. Uh. Um, it's the the explosively controversial international bestseller. Well, they didn't they didn't include Oak Island on that. 
<laughs> I hate that show. Oh my god. <laughs> Me too. God, that show. Um, no, they. Did I was not. just gonna say with the writing of these things, especially uh, Dan Brown, there was a uh, quote from the legendary director Howard Hawks, who did uh, "Bringing Up Baby" and "The Big Sleep." with um, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, he said people don't care so much about story uh, coherency as they do about just having fun with it. There's truth to that. that. Yeah. Well, Well, as long as you don't do something so glaring, it pulls you out of the story. Right. Right. The thing with both Dan Brown and... Okay, so Dan Brown did use a lot of the information from the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail. We're getting way off topic here, but just... We're still kind of a little bit about the Mona Lisa. And there's apparently Da Vinci and had all these secret signs in his paintings as well, pointing to all kinds of things. But I think what the books do is if, if they're well written, they make you feel smart. They give you just enough information for you to understand what's going on and maybe figure out a little bit for yourself Mm -hmm. and then if you and then a few pages later you go ah i was right i figured that out myself you know pat myself everybody wants to feel good about themselves right and And brown genius at making people feel smart and and, uh, something that john fowles mentioned in his uh very mind twisting uh book the magus he said the harder someone works to uncover the truth a fact, the more they're likely they are to believe it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. You don't want to think you put all that work in and it all just, it's all worth nothing. Right. That makes perfect uh, sense. Anyway, yeah, apparently there are all kinds of secrets in, in the Mona Lisa and, and other bits of his work. And yeah, it gets a bit, it gets a bit silly at times. Uh, in looking at the enforcement side of that that is how law enforcement goes after um these guys i was kind of surprised that new york didn't have its own squad for art theft is new york a hotbed i would think there might be some with all the galleries there well i mean maybe i'm wrong I should, yeah, I don't have a breakdown per state or country or anything. I just know that um, it, it's basically any museum is up for grabs, like anything in any museum. If you think you can get away with it, then yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay. LA has its own squad for it. That's really weird. It, the city itself has its own squad. Mm hmm. Because I know the FBI has the. The, uh, what's it actually we just had it up there what's it called the stolen art unit yeah yep. stolen and looted art um, art crime also, team all right, yeah I've also got something called um, the rapid deployment art crime team is the, I think the full name <laughs> I don't know why it's the rapid deployment I guess they get in fast <laughs> <laughs> you, got, you got a stolen painting we'll be there in minutes we'll be there Boom. faster than faster but than wait pizza. we have to go investigate this cafe that got robbed <laughs> can you imagine that the Ghent altarpiece is, is missing and you go and investigate a cheese shop instead they really, must really like their cheese in Bruges I don't know <laughs> <laughs> then why not <laughs> um, yeah no I, I was looking up I guess um, I was looking up the FBI stuff and um, Apparently they've got, I, 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 you might correct me if I'm wrong, I think they've got about 13 permanent agents plus a program manager. Yep. And they all have to learn art history, various languages, but also like the business of art. So, for example, how much is it worth from a criminal point of view, like that 10% oh. of value and, you know, how much is it going to be worth in Italy? If we trade it in, are you going to get how many years off? And they have to understand all that business part of it as well. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. And they also have the National Stolen Art File, the database, and apparently it has over 2,000 entries just for the FBI database. Now, there's databases around the world as well, but the FBI one has um, over 2,000 entries in it of just missing art. 
Who do you have? Too bad to... there's no way to access it uh, to see which ones are on it. Yeah, I'd love to see that. I mean, you can go, you can, you can Google, um, you know, show me the most valuable pieces of missing art or the, the oldest pieces or the, you know, the cold cases and stuff like that and show you. But, um, yeah, I would love to get Do we have any idea it. which countries have the, the most art stolen? Is it the U.S.? Is it France? Is it Italy? Is it somewhere else? Is it Asia and some, you know, who knows? I, I, just based on my initial reading, I'm going to guess that it's probably because they had the. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I missed the. Probably who? Italy. Okay. And the only reason I'm saying this is because they've had, and I, I haven't been seen this word, is the, it's the Italian police, Carabinier, Carabinieri, um, is the, the, the Italian police. Right. But they've also, they've also got the Carabinieri Art Squad. And they've got 300 members just of the Carabinieri Art Squad. And they've been set up since 1969. So either they have more art stolen from Italy than anywhere else, or they've just, um, they just really take it seriously. I don't know. Well, very interesting. All right, so next week we are going to talk about forgeries. Yay! Looking forward to that. This has been a great, uh, great episode. We appreciate you being on. As always, Kelly, we've missed having you around. Sorry. Mm -hmm. a huge amount of information in such a short period of time, but it's it's absolutely a huge topic. It is. And mm -hmm. it's. And it's mostly criminals. Oh, and um, I think I pointed out they only they get less than ten percent of the art back, and a large proportion of that art is in, in terrible shape, because criminals don't care about the art; they care about the value of the art. Um, so they care that it's worth, like, for collateral purposes. Right. Right. Um, they don't care whether the art is destroyed or whether, like, they use a knife to cut it out of the out of the frames, like we discussed. They they do all of that stuff. Um, in fact, the, the Van Goghs that were stolen were actually found under a floorboard in some um, criminal's, his dad's kitchen. So, they, like, they really don't care. They store them anywhere. They damage them. Um, yeah, they're, they're just completely just, you know, mostly mm -hmm. broken. Um, it's criminal so it, what they do. It is criminal. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> Which All right. Forgeries is an awesome topic to get into because there, there's some really interesting. You don't want to support these guys, but there really are some interesting characters that um, that that are involved in the forgery world. Yes, there are, and I've seen some shows about some of them. Looking forward to that. I worked, Orson Welles, F for fake. I worked at the Victoria and Albert Museum for a while, and there was a big kerfuffle with some constables, and it, yeah, there is. And it's one of the reasons that a lot of museums now do not want to get involved in um, authenticating art because they, if they're wrong, they can yeah. get sued. Yeah. And if they're right and it's the wrong person that they're talking to, they can get sued. And it, it's just everybody gets sued for everything these days. So, right. Right. yeah, it's, it's such a contentious um, topic. So it should be fun talking about it. Very good. All right. Cool. Good night. Good night. Good night. Wow, 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 wow,